turn now to the war. The number of U.S. troops killed in Iraq is at 4,000. Four soldiers died Sunday when a roadside bomb exploded near their vehicle in southern Baghdad. The symbolic 4,000 mark was reached just days after the fifth anniversary of the war. 2007 was the deadliest year for the U.S. military, with over 900 soldiers killed. Many thousands more have been wounded. Meanwhile, at least 58 Iraqis died Sunday. The total number of Iraqis killed since the start of the war may be over 1 million. The scale of casualties is staggering, but the corporate media rarely asks why the war was allowed to happen in the first place. One reason might be the corporate media bears some responsibility for legitimizing the invasion and occupation of Iraq. That's the premise of a new book chronicling the failure of the media on covering Iraq. It's by Greg Mitchell. He is the editor of Editor and Publisher. His book is called So Wrong for So Long. How the Press, the Pundits, and the President Failed on Iraq. Greg Mitchell joins us now in our Firehouse studio. Welcome to Democracy Now! Happy New Year. We're moving into the sixth year of this war. What's so interesting about your book is that you start from the beginning, and it's almost like a diary, a journal, of how the foundation was built, the justifications were built for war. Right. Well, it's really the first five-year history uh, that anyone's written, I think, and it goes from the run-up to the uh, surge debate last fall. So it really is a, a chronology. It's uh, not in calendar form, of course, but it really does cover the whole the whole period. So you do get all the the arguments and the the debate and the the failures before the invasion was launched, and then the five years of, of deceit and shortcomings uh, ever since. Talk about the pre-invasion period and what you felt was most, how the media was most successful in laying the f false foundation. Right, right. Well, as you said, it really was the mainstream media that, starting early on, uh, relayed the, uh, the false information that came from the administration. Uh, as we know, the New York Times and the Washington Post among, among the worst in that. Um, and it not only was... Uh, putting forth the false information, but also the placement of it, putting it on the front page. It, was, it wasn't just a matter of carrying the information. So it had tremendous impact on everyone, including Democrats in Congress who were afraid to speak out. Were you getting response at the time? I mean, you were writing about this right. at Editor and Publisher right. and online. Well, I, I mean, that's the thing. I, uh, we were among the few who were really deeply questioning in the, in the mainstream uh, what was being put out. So it was not a secret to us. Uh, people have said about the Knight Ritter Washington office and others who were, were covering this within the mainstream. So there were people who were uh, covering, uh, covering the, the actual facts and, and raising the questions uh, about the need for war, about the WMD, about the links to Al Qaeda and so forth. So it was not information that was really impossible to get. Talk about the Iraq follies, and you've summarized this in a recent piece you did. The 18 things you we've already forgotten about the media's uh, flawed coverage of right. Iraq. Well, it's uh, really going back to the uh, the run up and, and past the run up. All the various commentators. Uh, like uh, Chris Matthews or Bill O'Reilly or uh, David Brooks and Tom Friedman. Uh, people like to poke fun at Tom Friedman for the so-called Friedman unit, where he continually every six months would say, let's give the war another six months, and that went on for four years. Uh, Thomas but Friedman that was actually, yeah, Times. Thomas Friedman, yeah. But that was uh, actually sort of a majority position. If you go back, uh, I had to write at editor and publisher. Uh, and it's all collected in the book, uh, about every three months I would write a, a column saying, when is the first major newspaper going to come out for a re reverse course uh, and to begin a pullout? And every three months I would write this, and it never happened and never happened until last year. So the Thomas Friedman uh, situation really was the, uh, the mainstream view. Um, you have number one, the day before the invasion, Bill O'Reilly said, if the Americans go in and overthrow Saddam Hussein and it's clean, uh, he has nothing. I'll apologize to the nation. I'll not trust the Bush administration again, all right? Right. Well, that didn't quite happen. He did have a, a brief period when there were all those polls came out that showed that the Iraqis, uh, the majority of Iraqis were in favor of shooting at Americans. And uh, that kind of threw him off his game for about a week. And he said, well, if they don't want us there, let's get out. But then he, you know, he kind of settled down. After the fall of Baghdad, MSNBC's Chris Matthews declares, we're all neocons now. Well, he's, you know, I think Chris likes to think of himself as being anti-war now, but he was a cheerleader as much as anyone back then, and that, that might surprise a few people. But there was someone else at MSNBC, um, Phil Donahue. Right. 
Well, yeah, Phil, Phil was, uh, was really their star before the war. Uh, and uh, he actually took the radical position of occasionally having anti-war people on, maybe, maybe even yourself occasionally. Uh, and uh, because of that, he was accused of being insufficiently patriotic. And so he was, uh, shortly thereafter, was let go at the network, even though his ratings were higher than, than anyone else. Right before the invasion, right. he's fired, and that secret right. NBC right. memo comes right. out that That's says right. we can't have our flagship show uh, having these anti-war voices right. when other networks are waving the American right. flag. Then you have um, the same day of the fall of Baghdad, Joe Scarborough, also on MSNBC, saying, I'm waiting to hear the words I was wrong from some of the world's most elite journalists, politicians, and Hollywood types. Right. Well, I mean, Joe is someone else, again, today, who, who thinks of himself as being critical of the war and how it was conducted and so forth, but it really is. I think one of the values of the book is that it really does allow you to go back and re relive these. Uh, it may not be a happy uh, experience, but it uh, really lets you relive the experience as it happened. You know, it's not just a looking back and I'm looking back today and saying, you know, it was really screwed up and here's how people messed up. It really is chronicles as it happened. So you get a much better sense of how, uh, what was being said at the time and, and the failures at the time. We're talking to Greg Mitchell. He is editor of Editor and Publisher and has just published the book So Wrong for So Long, How the Press, the Pundits, and the President Failed on Iraq. We'll come back and talk about that White House um, correspondence dinner with Stephen Colbert and his significance and all of this in a minute. We can chase down all our enemies, bring them to their knees. Michael Franti, Bomb the World, here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Our guest, Greg Mitchell. He's editor of Editor and Publisher. Explain what Editor and Publisher is. <laughs> it's one of the oldest magazines in the country. It's the journal of the newspaper industry. It goes back 125 years ago. So it's a long-standing, venerable publication and, of course, now a very active website. His book is called So Wrong for So Long. Now, the White House Correspondents' Dinner uh, each year, you right. talk about one of them right at the time of the invasion. Right. Well, it was actually a similar dinner, radio and TV correspondents, ah. same idea. But, uh, you know, the usual thing is for the, they poke fun at the president, and sometimes the president shows up and pokes fun at himself. And uh, this was, uh, you know, three or four years ago. Uh, and it was really one of the, I'd, I'd call it one of the worst disgraceful moments in the history of the presidency, where President Bush uh, appeared and showed a video, or, or actually a slideshow, of him sort of looking around the White House and looking under desks and looking under chairs. And he kept saying, where are those missing WMDs? I can't find those uh, missing WMDs. Are they over here? Are they over there? And um, the media laughed like crazy about it. They thought it was one of the funniest things they'd seen. And even afterwards, there was very few, very little criticism. David Korn was one who did raise some criticism. But there was very little criticism from the media. And, that, and I don't know which was more disgraceful, the president's actions or the media's lack of response. Well, let's go to Stephen Colbert. This was later. This right. was um, April 2006. Of course, Colbert, a host of Comedy Central's fake news program, The Colbert Report, uh, mocking the press for its failings in a blistering routine at the White House Correspondents Association dinner in May of 2006. He was the featured speaker of the night. He addressed a packed crowd that very significantly included President Bush 
also a number of cabinet members, most of the country's most recognizable TV anchors and correspondents. This is some of what Stephen Colbert had to say. As, as excited as I am to be here with the president, I am appalled to be surrounded by the liberal media that is destroying America, with the exception of Fox News. <laughs> Fox News gives you both sides of every story, the president's side and the vice president's side. <laughs> but the rest of you, what are you thinking? Reporting on NSA wiretapping or secret prisons in Eastern Europe? Those things are secret for a very important reason. They're super depressing. <laughs> and if that's your goal, well, misery accomplished.